Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, Episode 17, Project Gemini Flight 4, Gemini 7. 14 days, 5.6 million miles, and two guys in the front seat of a car. Frank Borman and Jim Lovell are in space. Well, they're not there anymore, but that's where we left them last time, so let's pretend we're in 1965. Frank Borman and Jim Lovell are in space. They've been up there for a while, and they've got a ways to go, so let's leave them for a moment and take a step back to see how they got there. Before Borman and Lovell were in space, Wally Schirra and Tom Stafford were supposed to be in space. As we discussed last time, Gemini 6 was to be the first NASA attempt at orbital rendezvous and docking, chasing down a Gemini Agena target vehicle. Unfortunately, the Agena had other plans and exploded in space, leaving the crew of Gemini 6 in a pickle. The surprising solution was to have Gemini 7 launch first and have the renamed Gemini 6A rendezvous with it instead. Last week was a bit of a spoiler, the plan was a huge success. But while focusing on 6A, we only briefly touched on the activities of 7. This week, we'll flip perspectives and see the mission from the viewpoint of Gemini 7. Gemini 5 helped pave the way to the moon by proving that there would be no significant medical issues associated with 8 days in space, the amount of time required to fly to the moon and back. But despite the success of Gordo Cooper and Pete Conrad, questions still lingered about the effects of long-term spaceflight on the human body. The primary mission of Gemini 7 was to examine this problem in detail during an incredibly long two-week mission. Along with simply being in space and waiting down the clock, the crew would also perform a record-breaking number of experiments during their lengthy time in orbit. They would also face unique challenges on top of the already considerable list of issues they could expect based on previous flights. The crew would have to play pilot, engineer, housekeeper, scientist, and guinea pig, all while keeping their vehicle working over the course of a trip over 5 million miles long. Who would sign up for a trip like that? Well, Frank Frederick Borman would serve as command pilot of Gemini 7 and was born on March 14, 1928, in Gary, Indiana. He attended the U.S. Military Academy at West Point before becoming a fighter pilot in the United States Air Force. He later attended Caltech, where he earned his master's degree in aeronautical engineering. He put that degree to good use as an assistant professor at West Point, teaching thermodynamics and fluid mechanics for three years. Following his stint as an assistant professor, Borman became a research test pilot. It was in this role that he was recruited by NASA as part of the second astronaut group, also known as the New Nine. This is his first of two space flights. Riding shotgun was James Jim Lovell, born just nine days after his future colleague Borman on March 25, 1928, in Cleveland, Ohio. Lovell attended the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, graduating in 1952 before heading off to flight training. After training, he served for three years as the pilot of the F-2H Banshee fighter jet, repeatedly performing one of the most hair-raising feats in aviation, a carrier landing at night. After his time with the Banshee, Lovell went through test pilot training. Alongside him, his classmates were Wally Schirra and Pete Conrad, but Lovell finished first in the class. Lovell remained at the Naval Air Station for four years as a test pilot and instructor until NASA came calling in 1962. This was his first of four space flights. This seems like a good time to tell a short personal story about Jim Lovell. When I was nine or ten years old, my dad noticed that Jim Lovell was appearing at a nearby convention and would be signing copies of his book, Lost Moon, detailing the harrowing events of Apollo 13. I had seen the film based on the famous mission, but didn't really appreciate who Mr. Lovell was, but my dad insisted I'd appreciate it later. We arrived late, but Mr. Lovell agreed to stick around for a few minutes to meet an eager space nerd kid. To be honest, I was a little confused because I think I was expecting to meet Tom Hanks. Mr. Lovell shook my hand, asked a few questions I don't recall, and signed a copy of his book for me, an item I cherish to this day. I had fun traveling to Boston, and that old man seemed nice enough, but the impact of the meeting didn't really hit me until years later, when I suddenly stopped dead and realized, holy crap, I met Jim Lovell. 
Many years before that day, however, Level and his command pilot, Frank Borman, climbed aboard the spacecraft that would be their home for the next two weeks. In an attempt to keep their biological clocks more or less at normal Houston time, the launch was scheduled for the afternoon, allowing the astronauts to sleep in until the leisurely time of 7 a.m. Maybe the extra sleep helped because the countdown went smoothly and presented no major issues. Three seconds after 2.30 p.m. on December 4th, 1965, Lovell called out, We're on our way, Frank! And the Titan II missile lofted them on the start of their epic journey. Just minutes later, pyrotechnic charges separated the capsule from the booster, leaving streaming tails of adhesive tape as the Gemini 6A crew would discover days later. There was a long mission ahead of them, but work began immediately with another attempt at station keeping with the spent upper stage of the Titan II rocket. The astronauts had taken the lessons of Gemini 4's failed station keeping to heart, and it proved no trouble for Borman's skilled hand. However, Borman only stayed in the vicinity of the upper stage for 15 or so minutes, since he didn't want to expend too much precious fuel so early on in the mission. Along with the orbital rendezvous lessons of Gemini 4, Borman and Lovell also benefited from the creature comfort lessons of Gemini 5. 5 went on to become overshadowed by the somewhat bonkers duration of 7, but let's not forget that 8 days in a Gemini capsule is nothing to sneeze at. The crew struggled with keeping the cabin tidy, sleeping while the other astronaut worked, and keeping themselves occupied during downtime. The crew of Gemini 7 decided that they would keep their schedules in sync, working, eating, and sleeping at the same time. They were also determined to maintain a clean and organized cabin throughout the lengthy mission. With so many food packets, experiment equipment, waste bags, and other gear literally floating around, it wouldn't take much for the capsule to become dangerously cluttered. They also took Pete Conrad up on his advice and brought along a couple of books for the trip, just in case. Part of keeping the cabin tidy was being fastidious with a topic that I've avoided until now but can put off for no longer. Gemini 7 was nearly 14 days long. The crew was going to need a way to poop in space. Up until the Gemini program, waste wasn't a large issue. With an all-male flight crew, urine was easy enough to collect with a specialized hose. Feces was another matter. These astronauts did not have the modern luxury of the still somewhat distressing toilet on today's International Space Station. The crews adhered to a low-residue diet to reduce the need for number two, but that couldn't last forever. So, here's how they did it. First, I hope you're good friends with your co-pilot, because privacy was non-existent. The Gemini capsule has been compared to the front seat of a Volkswagen Beetle. The lack of gravity made it a little roomier than it looks at first glance, but that didn't change the fact that some dude was floating just a few inches away. When the time came, the astronaut would grab a special plastic bag that came with an adhesive surface on the lip. Taking what I imagine would be great care to ensure that the lip was properly sealed to his rear, the astronaut would do his business. Unfortunately, he's still not done. Left to its own devices, bacteria in the waste would generate gas that could potentially cause the bags to rupture in the small space. Yikes! So a bacteria-killing tablet had to be added to the contents of the bag and then massaged around to make sure it was mixed properly. Okay, is this too gross? I think this is too gross. Believe it or not, I could keep going with even worse details, but I'll leave it to you, dear listener, to research it on your own if you're interested. After the entire horrible process, which could take up to an hour, was completed, the bag would be stored behind the vehicle's ejector seats. The solid waste, along with samples of the liquid waste, would be studied by experts on the ground to help determine the effects of extended weightlessness on the crew's digestion process. Yuck. Alright, let's leave our increasingly ripe flyboys behind for a bit and take a look at what's happening on the ground. Mission control has changed a lot since we last looked at it. For one thing, the last time we took a good look at it, it wasn't even in Houston yet. No longer a few newbies drafted from the aviation world to keep a single pilot safe for a few hours beyond the atmosphere, Mission Control now comprised whole teams of people with different duties. They also had to accommodate increasingly long missions. On his flight aboard Friendship 7, John Glenn only needed support for just under five hours. 
a system had to be developed to deal with what were quickly becoming nearly arbitrarily long missions. Starting with the four-day flight of Gemini 4, mission controllers adopted a three-shift strategy. The first shift was the Red Team, led by the original flight director himself, Chris Kraft. His team was on shift during the major planned events of the mission, including launch and entry, as well as tasks such as EVA and docking, or in Seven's case, experiments, orbital maneuvers, and the arrival of 6A. Next came the White Team, led by Gene Kranz. Kranz's team would take care of spacecraft housekeeping and maintenance, keeping the vehicle and its various consumables in optimal shape. And thirdly came the Blue Team, led by John Hodge. The Blue Team worked while the astronauts slept, and were responsible for updating the mission plan and making sure that the tasks for the following day were clear and ready to go. Of course, over a lengthy mission, some of these responsibilities would be handled by all three teams, and by other mission controllers not on active duty, but the framework proved useful and endured for years to come. On this flight, mission control proved to be the source of some tension between the crew and the ground. The crew wanted to take off their uncomfortable spacesuits, and the guys on the ground did not. With astronaut comfort in mind, a new lightweight version of the Gemini spacesuit had been developed for this mission. It had fewer layers, making it lighter and easier to move, and replaced the exterior hard helmet with a soft hood that could be unzipped and stowed behind the astronaut's head. They still had a protective helmet on underneath the hood, but didn't need that full bubble you've probably seen before. But that didn't change the fact that they'd still be wearing an airtight suit in a stuffy cabin for nearly two weeks. The concern was that if something went wrong with the vehicle, there would not be enough time to correct it or don the awkward suit. It only takes a few seconds to lose consciousness due to a lack of oxygen, far less time than it took to perform an emergency deorbit. Eventually, a compromise was struck. As the taller of the two, Lovell would remove his suit, and Borman would keep his on. Lovell didn't need to be told twice and quickly wriggled out of his suit, becoming the first American to fly in space without the protection of a pressurized suit. Lovell quickly cooled down and became far more comfortable with the restrictive garments stowed for later use. Borman complained frequently about the impact his suit was having on him, and his complaints seemed to have been borne out. Later comparison of Borman and Lovell's sleep showed that Lovell slept easier and longer. I found imagining this situation to be really funny. Here we have a super advanced spacecraft on a record-breaking flight, with one guy grumbling under his breath in a spacesuit, and another guy just floating around in his long john underwear. Borman asked the capsule communicator to relay his wish to remove his suit to astronaut boss Deke Slayton, hoping that the request would gain more traction coming from Slayton. There was interest on the ground in comparing the physiological difference between being suited and unsuited, so after a few days of freedom, Lovell suited back up and Borman had a chance to relax. After doctors on the ground had a chance to review the difference the suits made in blood pressure, temperature, and pulse, mission controllers finally relented and both men were allowed to float freely. NASA scientists must have felt bad for the poor crew of Gemini 7 with all of their free time and not much to do, because they provided an impressive 18 experiments to perform during the mission. Six of these were flying for the first time. The 12 returning experiments included the classics like bone demineralization studies, magnetometers, astronaut visual acuity, and the always popular Earth photography. First among the new experiments was a study of the waste products generated by the crew. By taking a close look at carefully collected urine, and by comparing blood samples from before and after the flight, it was possible to learn a great deal about how the human body adapted to weightlessness. For the first few days, Frank Borman would be the subject of the next experiment, a study of Borman's sleep patterns. This was accomplished by placing some electrodes on Borman's head, allowing instruments to measure his brain waves making this the first use of electroencephalography, or EEG, in space. I also want you to know, I pronounced that word correctly on my first try. The experiment could only be performed for a few days, since Borman's hair would grow back in and prevent the electrodes from working. One of the experiments that was mounted outside the spacecraft, much to the cramped crew's relief, 
was a laser used in an attempt at optical communication. The far more focused beam of a laser could potentially be used to send greater amounts of data than a traditional radio signal. Unfortunately, while the crew was able to successfully direct their laser to a sensor on the ground, the connection was just too tenuous to use. Next on our list of new experiments was a measurement of the visual contrast of various landmarks such as coastlines. This was done to assist navigation systems for the upcoming Apollo missions. And speaking of navigation, one more experiment involved tracking individual stars as they disappeared behind the Earth in order to ascertain the spacecraft's position. This was tricky business, but could be essential in case of a navigation system failure. Lastly was the crew's least favorite experiment, since it extended for several weeks both before and after the mission. Scientists were interested in how extended weightlessness affects the balance of calcium and other important minerals in the human body. Apparently, this isn't the easiest thing to measure. The astronauts were required to adhere to a strict diet before, during, and after the mission for several weeks. They were also required to carefully collect their waste for further analysis. I read through the press release for this mission, and it included this lovely image. Quote, Sweat will also be measured by careful cleansing of the crew in distilled water following recovery. Undergarments will be similarly cleaned and the water analyzed. Welcome back to Earth. Science is cool, but let's be honest. The most exciting part of the mission was when Gemini 7 played orbital host to the visiting crew of Gemini 6A. A few days into the mission, the Gemini 7 crew placed themselves in a 300-kilometer-high circular orbit to make the approach as simple as possible for the Gemini 6A crew. Though I'm sure they would have been eager to try the rendezvous techniques out for themselves, the 7 crew were passive partners in this exercise. As long as they kept their tracking lights and radar transponder on and didn't make any sudden movements, the 6A crew were going to be happy. At 2.33 p.m. on December 15, 1965, after 11 days on their own, the crew of Gemini 7 had company. As I mentioned last time, the two crews spent their time together taking photos, talking over the radio, taking turns maneuvering around each other, and generally just having a great time. At one point, the two vehicles even came within a foot of each other. But 6A's mission was not a long one so it was only a few short hours before they exchanged their goodbyes and Shira and Stafford faded to a pinpoint of light in the distance. Borman and Lovell were left on their own to orbit for a further two days. Once the big rendezvous event was over, the crew's energy seemed to deflate. The cramped, stuffy, and uncomfortable quarters were grating on the crew, and there simply wasn't much to do and now there wasn't even anything to look forward to other than the end of the mission. Borman spent time reading the Mark Twain novel Roughing It, while Lovell paged through Drums Along the Mohawk by Walter D. Edmonds. When describing the mission years after the fact, both men were able to laugh it off, but acknowledged that the final days were, as Borman put it simply, bad. The vehicle itself seemed to have shared the crew's feelings. One of the fuel cells that had been threatening to have problems for days finally began to act up, and some of the thrusters failed, simply expelling their fuel into space unburned. But the crew and their spacecraft persevered, and after the final dragging days were complete, it was time to come home. The equipment module was jettisoned, exposing the thoroughly cold-soaked retro rockets. Thankfully, the retro rockets performed as well as always despite their extended stay on orbit. Frank Borman had paid close attention to how Wally Shiraz guided entry went, and learned what lessons he could from the Mission Control's assessment. A yearning for professional excellence wasn't all that was behind Borman's close study, however. He and Shiraz had placed a small bet on who could land closest to the target point. It seems that the lessons paid off since Gemini 7 splashed down just over 7 miles from the target, edging out Shiraz's record-setting performance of just a few days before by about a mile. After 13 days, 18 hours, 35 minutes, and one second spent traveling over 5.6 million miles, Frank Borman and Jim Lovell were home. Shortly after splashdown, the two bedraggled spacemen were on the deck of the USS Wasp, a little shaky, 
but overall healthy, and surely glad to be in some fresh air and have a little space between them for once. Both men had held up remarkably well. They were able to walk across the deck of the carrier unassisted, suffered no serious loss of calcium, and arrived with the same blood volume they left with. Their bodies had reduced the number of blood cells, since floating takes less effort than standing, and replaced the extra volume with additional blood plasma. Human bodies are pretty impressive. If you'd like to know more about the weird specifics that happened to the Gemini 7 crew during their lengthy voyage, I'd recommend the book Packing for Mars by Mary Roach. It digs into a lot of the weird aspects of keeping humans alive in space. After a good night's sleep, both men were basically back to normal. And if I know astronauts, they were probably already itching for their next flight assignment. But for now, they would have to wait, since it was the next crew's time to shine. Would they finally be able to rendezvous with an Agena target vehicle? Would they be able to accomplish the first ever docking in space? Would they be able to perform useful work on a spacewalk? Find out in two weeks as we follow the highs, the lows, and the increasingly alarming spin of Gemini 8. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs>